Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we'll talk about this slightly more advanced topic of closures in JavaScript. I see this popping up quite a bit in forum posts, uh, mainly because I think people are just trying to figure out what the heck is a closure and how can I use it in my applications. Seems that there's a lot of fuss about closures with regards to JavaScript. And I think it's important to show you what the fuss really is all about. But as you're getting started, I would caution you against trying to shoehorn closures into your programming style. After you've had some experience working with JavaScript and you're working perhaps on a larger project, I suspect you'll have this aha moment where you'll realize, hey, closures could actually make the code that I'm writing much more elegant. And at that point, I think it'll become obvious to you why you need them. Now, since closures is an advanced feature, it's difficult for me to demonstrate closures in a way that's small enough and trivial enough to fit it in a small video, and yet practical enough to demonstrate how it can be useful or why you should be using it. So I want to emphasize that while you're watching this video, you should be striving to understand what closures are conceptually, uh, not necessarily even how to use them or why you would want to use it. Uh, that's something I believe that will become obvious to you once you become more experienced in JavaScript development. I, I'm sorry, that's the best that I can offer right now. Uh, also, I think it would be easier to show you how they work rather than start with this long explanation of what they are. All right, so all those caveats uh, are, are out of the way. Let's start with a simple example and we'll build on it to fully explain what a closure is and why it's significant in JavaScript. So you can see that I've already started off by creating our, our HTML page, c9js underscore 20.html using our template. You can see that I've added a script reference to our jQuery library and a script reference to script20.js. The only other interesting thing about this HTML page is that I have an anchor tag with an ID of build cat and some random text here that's not important. So take a moment, pause the video and catch up if you need to. Let's switch over and take a look now at script 20. I've created a simple example. This is not a closure, but it's a starting point that we can build on. And let me explain what's going on here. And again, pause the video if you need to, to type this in, or if you like, just copy it from the, the files that uh, I've supplied that accompany uh, this lesson. So inside of our jQuery ready function, we're defining First of all, a function, build a cat, and then we'll execute that build a cat whenever somebody clicks on that href, or I'm sorry, that anchor tag with the ID of build cat that we looked at a moment ago. What's interesting is this function build a cat. This build a cat function starts off by creating a functionally scoped variable called cat name, and that cat name will be used inside of an inner function called cat factory. In fact, when build a cat is executed, the first thing that happens is the variable name will be assigned, then cat factory will be executed, which will then execute this method that merely pops open an alert box displaying the cat name from our functionally scoped cat name variable. Okay, so let's see this in action first of all to get started, make sure I have everything saved. And then let's open it up in Internet Explorer, and I click on the link, and it opens up an alert box with Mr. Tibbles. All right, great. So now that we have that stage set, let me show you another version of this example that uses closures, and we'll compare the two. All right, here we go. I just want to remind myself and of this little note here.
Therefore, I'm going to get rid of these open and closing parentheses. So make sure that cat when you return cat factory, it's not executing it. It's merely returning a reference to our function cat factory. Okay. Let's continue on here. gonna make another little note here. Okay, so let's go ahead and make sure this works before we get too far. And it does, great. Okay, so let's talk about what this is doing. This time, also built a build a cat function that will be executed in just a moment. We have created a functionally scoped variable called cat name, assigning its value, initializing it to the string Tuffy. We've created a cat factory function and then we're returning a reference. We're not going to execute that function. We're just going to return it to whoever calls this build a cat function. So that when we call build a cat, we're going to get back a reference to this inner function cat factory. Now at this point, we've called build a cat and we have retrieved a reference to that function. And I say, it's gone out of scope now, right? And all of its private function variables with it, right? I mean, at this point, we have a reference to just this function. What about all this other information, like cat name, for example? Does it persist around? Does it still work? Well, we saw that it actually does stay around. And I'll just add the cat name uh, variable value lives, okay? It was indeed somehow stored along with the implementation of cat factory because when we called cat factory, even though we're just calling this little snippet of code right here, it still had knowledge of this outer value cat name and was able to display Tuffy in an alert box, all right? So based on what we know about functional scope, we wouldn't have expected the variable cat name to still be around and hold its value, Tuffy. We would have expected that variable to have gone out of scope. However, in this case, my new cat has become a closure. I think of a closure as a snapshot of the function's outer environment at the time the closure is created. A closure is created at the moment when you assign a function reference and a copy of its environment into memory by create, putting it inside of a variable like we did right here, okay? So we took a snapshot of the function as well as any data that was available to it at the time when we created our closure. So we get both the function's implementation as well as its environment. In other words, any variables or input parameters that were in scope at the time when we took the snapshot. So put it another way, a closure is a special type of object that combines a function and the environment in which that function was created. The environment consists again of local variables that were in scope at the time the closure was created as well as any input parameters uh, that were passed in. In this case we don't have any. Okay. So another way to think of it is that you're binding some data to a function and then storing it as a variable for use later in your application. Okay, so so what? Why is this important? 
Well, closures are often considered an advanced feature in JavaScript. They're like shortcuts. They, they hold on to lots of, of information, implementation, and data, uh, and they can be used in, in a bunch of different ways. Understanding them is essential to mastering the language. Knowing when to use them is a little more tricky. One place that it's used most often is in the module pattern. I've referenced this mysterious module pattern before. Let me just show you in its simple, simplest form what a module pattern looks like. Let me just paste in some code here. Let me go ahead and get rid of that and just go ahead and get rid of this too. There we go. A module pattern basically, in a nutshell, it allows us to have a private implementation and a public interface. So when you call this function literal and call its public function member, it will execute and use any private information like, for example, this private function or any um, uh, variables that were defined at a function scope, and it can use them inside of the implementation of your of your public function. Why is it public? Because you see we're using this return with an object literal, okay? So that's uh, in a nutshell how you're able to get kind of the behavior that you would get in C Sharp and Visual Basic where you have some things defined as private and some things defined as public. It's just uh, a different uh, syntax for it and uh, the notion is a little bit different as well how it can be used. Uh, if you don't really understand what that means, don't really worry about it. It's not that important. But I wanted to show you one way in which closures, closures are often used. So in a sense, when you create a closure, you're doing the rough equivalent in JavaScript of what you would do in object-oriented programming languages like Visual Basic or C Sharp, where you create an instance of an object, like so, and it has its own instance variables like so. In JavaScript, a closure is an instance of a function complete with its own instance values. Okay? So let me show you another little practical example I found online. And it's a practical example because it shows you how concisely you can write this code. And this is interesting from a couple of perspectives. Let me go ahead and address this page that we're looking at first and then I'll show you the example itself. This jsfiddle.net is one of many little playgrounds that are available on the internet. This happens to be my favorite. I know of at least two or three others that are available out there. And you can sign up for a free account and it's all free and it just allows you to first of all type in some HTML. You don't have to use head and body and all that stuff. You can type in some CSS and you don't have to create your own external file. It'll just be referenced automatically in your HTML. Then you can create some JavaScript and you don't have to put it in a script tag. You don't have to put it in its own external file. It's just available here. And then you see the results of all that work over here in this result pane in the lower right hand corner. You can also add some uh, references to external libraries like jQuery, for example, or a number of other ones. So it's a nice little platform to just throw some ideas together and test some ideas. And I used it a couple of times while I was creating uh, this series of videos just to test out some ideas and get some examples uh, down without having to go and create a bunch of files, right? But at any rate, let's focus on the part of this example that uh, is pertinent to uh, our conversation about closures. The HTML isn't all that interesting. However, it does give us some uh, insight as to what's going on here with a paragraph H1 and H2, which we see here. Those are all defined by default with font sizes and uh, you see the H1 and H2 are relative using the EMs on the end, okay? Um, but what's more interesting is this function called make sizer. And so as we click the different links here, I can make the text larger and smaller. So it might be good for uh, providing a, a little bit of functionality at the very top of every web page that allows people to make the text larger so and more readable, all right? But at any rate, notice what this function is doing. It's taking as an input parameter uh, a size, so 12, 14, or 16, for example. And then it marries the, the function implementation with this number that's passed in. So it'll be, uh, it'll set the document.body.style.font size equal to 12px or 14px or 16px. Then this next little section of JavaScript is where it actually makes that call passing in 12, 14, and 16. 
and stores those enclosures. Now this closure has both the implementation as well as the data and it stores it in a nice little small package, this nice little closure. From this point on, all I need to do is check the on click event of each of my anchor tags that are defined here. And when you click on the size 14 ID, for example, it's going to call the on click event and set that on click event equal to size 14, this closure that has encapsulated both the implementation as well as the 14 PX font size. That's what allows us to get lots of functionality here in a very small package. And it's a very concise example of using, uh, of using closures. Okay, so to recap, a closure is simple. It's just a special type of object in JavaScript that combines a function and its implementation along with the environment in which that function was created. Any local variables or input arguments are all co combined together and then you can use that closure, that reference to the function and data throughout the remainder of your JavaScript code. It's as simple as that. How you use it, why you use it, that's the topic for another day, okay? So I'm gonna have a little bit more to say in closing uh, for this entire series, but if you made it this far and you've worked your way through the examples like I've demonstrated on screen, then I have to think that you have at least a more full understanding. I hope it was beneficial to you. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this series. There's a lot of work to work through hours and hours of listening to somebody talk, especially uh, about technical type of uh, subjects. So if you made it this far, awesome. Congratulations. Stay, stick with me. I got one more lesson. I'll give you some, some things that you could look out for and, and maybe where to go from here in the very next video. We'll see you there. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.